say welcome to you. Love you guys. I know, and I feel so loved. Uh, real quick, just uh, before I start, there's uh, some practical things I need to get out of the way. This is important. Bethel Leadership Team is inviting you to take part in a, in a survey so that we can assess your needs and the needs of the community. And we're asking those of you online to participate also. And uh, if you haven't been at Bethel in a long time, you're open to participate in the survey also. Our goal is that Bethel and, you know, and we, we serve the Rochester community better. And uh, we, we reserve the right to get better. Pastor Robert used to say that. We reserve the right to get better. Um, and uh, in order to take part in that survey, you can go on, online on our, on our website and uh, we'll be putting it up on Facebook also. It, it'll take about 20 minutes, but we're asking you, please take the time to go through the survey and, uh, and answer all the questions. It would be really beneficial for us and therefore be beneficial to you. So um, participate in the survey. And before I get into my message this morning, I feel like Laura, Laura mentioned this and I absolutely agreed with her. Um, you know, we're we're living in crazy times and trying times in our, in our city and in, in our nation. And I feel like we need to pray for our leaders, um, two, two leaders, uh, President Trump and Melania, his, his wife, have been diagnosed with COVID. So I'd like to pray for them, and I'd like to pray for Mayor Lovely also. Um, and just, just the Rochester Police Department and all that's going on in, in our city, that peace would reign and uh, that the Lord's will would be, would, would be done. You know, I don't, I don't care where you are at, your political persuasion or who you lean, to, lean towards, God wants to bless everyone, yeah. wants to reveal himself to everyone. And, in, and it's our job to pray for our leaders, whether you elected them in or not. And uh, so let's, it, let's as, as people of God, let's go before the Lord. Lord, we just thank you for your, your presence, um, your active presence in this world. Uh, you're not disconnected from us. You don't, you don't stand there and just watch it all happen. You respond to our prayers, and uh, we know that you're responding to our prayers now. So right now, we speak healing in Jesus' name over President Trump and Melania, his, his wife, and anybody else that's been, been affected in, in the administration by this COVID virus. We say be healed in Jesus' name, and Lord, supernaturally, give them revelation, revelation to help us, um, uh, to help us really prosper in, in a spiritual way in, uh, in this country. And Lord, we, we lift up Mayor Lovely, we lift up the police department, we lift up our city, and we say, Lord, um, through dreams and visions, deliver them to those, those who are, are leading our city so, so that our city becomes a haven of shalom peace. Lord, I, I believe that violence can be removed, hatred can be removed, and racism can be removed. I believe that we can live in a city of peace, and I just declare that over our city of Rochester, that this, place, that this city would be a place of shalom peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this morning, I want to talk to you about kingdom stewardship. We've been talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the ethics of the kingdom, um, what the kingdom is and what, what it isn't. And I really f feel like I, I want to talk to you about kingdom stewardship, but I, I realized I, I always tend to bite off more than I could chew when I, put, when I do a study like this. And I realize I can't talk to you about the parable, the talents, and, and kingdom stewardship principles in the life of Joseph all at once. Otherwise, you would be here for three hours. So I kind of scrapped that idea. And I always start out big, and then I, then I scale back. So I want to spend some time talking about the parable of the talents. Before I do, I want to talk about kingdom stewardship. You know, this is God's big idea, kingdom stewardship. It started in the garden. Not going to spend a lot of time, but I always go back to Genesis because I think it's so important. Because those were God's first instructions to mankind before sin entered into the world. This is why I created you, so do and take dominion. It was a cultural mandate. I think there were, there were spiritual things uh, that they needed to, needed to apply, but also, the also physical management of the world. For Adam and Eve, it was naming the animals. Thank God he didn't give that job to me. There'd be some strange names. Um, but but it, was, it was clearly God's intention that man manage what God owns, what he created. And I think Jesus reinforced this with his kingdom, kingdom teaching. You know, the kingdom of heaven is, is about kingdom's rule and kingdom, the, the kingdom's reign. And he has put us on this earth to be his agents, ambassadors, his, his, his priests, 
to, to, to usher in that sort of governmental rule. And it is a governmental rule. And, uh, and part, of that, part of that rule is this whole idea of stewardship. So I want to take today and, and another Sunday, I don't know if it's going to be next Sunday, but probably the Sunday after, to talk more about stewardship. But every structure, whether it be government, business, religious structure, was intended to be run by kingdom stewards. That was always God's idea. Now, kingdom stewards are not running everything, which is why there's many things that are a mess. You know, some things that are an absolute dismal mess and have totally failed. Um, but but God's, God's idea was that kingdom people be establishing these, these structures. And, you know, for, for about 2,000 years, I, I think the church has had fits and start. You've seen glimpses of the kingdom during certain reformations and, re, and revivals. Um, but it, it, it seems like people have a short memory or, and something happens and, and that, that revival doesn't have the same effect and people get complacent. I, I don't know. There's probably many reasons why th- that it happens. But then it, it's like you, you default to what's, to what's easy. And I think even, even for the church, you know, it's been busy building man structure in the church. This is good, but this is a glimpse of good. What, you, what you've been experiencing in your lifetime, going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays and being involved in outreach, and things, it's, it's good, but it's just a glimpse of good. You know, because we still have a world around us that's desperate, that needs salvation, that needs healing, and it's our job, the church's job, to bring that forward through our prayers and through the manifest, manifestation of the kingdom in us. Jesus, I think my, my dad mentioned this, Apostle Ron mentioned this last week, he didn't come to start another religion. He came to institute a kingdom, and that kingdom has a structure to it. That It's, it's a physical structure that can be seen. And uh, I think that we've... We, are, are benefits of some of the reformational kingdom structures that have been established in history. And I think it's a little over 500 years that Martin Luther nailed the 95 complaints on the door of the Catholic Church. And I don't mean to pick on the Catholic Church because you can just pick on the church in general. I mean, none of us, none of us are perfect, but, but it, the church was pretty corrupt back then, so much so that they were essentially selling forgiveness. You had to buy forgiveness. And Martin Luther... Um, put 95 complaints on this door, but I think a, a couple of those significant ones I'm going to bring out before I t- start talking about kingdom stewardship. But this, the Protestant Ref- Reformation, um, it, transcended, it transcended religion. It was way beyond re- religion and way beyond the church. And, and it, it's been said that the Protestant, Rest- the Protestant Reformation led to modern democracy, individualism, civil rights, and many of the modern values that we cherish today. If it was not for the Protestant Reformation, we probably wouldn't be experiencing the good in America. I, I know that there's bad in America, but there's a whole lot of good. I, I would say more good than bad. It's just that it seems like the bad gets the loudest voice for some reason. But, but all the good things and the freedom that we experience in this, in this country is really due to that Protestant Reformation. And two of the things... Uh, two of the things that, that Martin Luther brought out I want to touch on before I, I, I share with you this kingdom peril, parable of stewardship. I think one of the most revolutionary points was that the Bible, not tradition, was the source, source of spiritual authority and the priesthood of every believer. This was important, and this is going to be important for our application of the study this morning. In 1 Peter 2.5, it says, You also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Say that. I am a holy priesthood. You're called to be a priest. In your life and in your home and at your place of work, you are called to be a priest. And what that that means, there's a lot of implications to that, but what that meant when Martin Luther put put one of those complaints on the wall was that you have direct access to God. You don't need a mediator. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor to build a relationship with the Lord. You don't have to depend on them. You don't have to go to them to ask for forgiveness. You can go directly to God because of what Jesus did. I mean, that's what it means. I mean, that's, that's some of what it means to be, to be a priest. You have direct access to God. It means you have direct access to God and all of God, God's resources and heaven's resources. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life 
through our knowledge of him who has called, called us by his own glory and goodness. Notice this says a godly life in knowledge of him. A godly life doesn't mean just your spiritual life. It means your life. He's given you, as a priest, everything that you need for life and godliness. The empowerment, the wisdom, and the revelation to, to, be, to be a priest, to be an ambassador, to be a kingdom son and daughter that brings change and shift in this world. I think many of us, and I've been in this place in the past four or five months, um, I, I've shared with you in, in the past, I mean, I've felt things that I've never felt before. I've, I've felt hopelessness like I've never felt before. I've looked out at the climate, the political climate, and all the, the protests, and, uh, and, and all the anger, and all the, all the hate, and the violence perpetuated by men and women who don't know, who don't know the Lord, who think that they have the solutions. And I, and, and I see things falling apart. I see further division, further divide. And I'm thinking, Lord, this mess, how, how can this be fixed? I don't, I don't think you could fix it. I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean that, but that's, that's the way that I felt. It's like, it, it's like, it's, it's so bad. And I just have not, I have not felt that way in America before. I think other generations have, but I have not felt that way before. And, and, you know, the Holy Spirit comes in and invades, invades the, you know, my presence and, and says, you don't have it, but I, but I do. I have hope, and if you trust in me, then, then, then I can begin to shift these things, and I believe that. And I think, I think unless we really understand that we are priests, we are ambassadors, and we are stewards of everything that God has given us, we won't see reformation and transformation again. And I do believe that we are on the cusp of it. I think, I think we're, we're in a storm right now, but I think there's a calm that's going to come to that storm as God's kingdom people and the church rises up. So I want a good practical working definition of what a steward is. Just as I go into the parable of the talents, if you have your Bibles or your phone, your Bible apps, you can open up to Matthew 25. I'm going to be reading through uh, verse 14 and 30. This is the parable of the talents. But uh, Holman's Bible Dictionary defines stewardship as this. Utilizing and managing all resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation. So I, I used to think that ownership was key. Ownership was key for people to, to, to really begin to um, take care of their community. I'll, just, I'll break it down this way. Uh, you know, I've, I've been working in the city for a long time, and I know that when people own things, they take care of it better. God has really shifted my thinking about this idea of ownership. And I think if you're an owner, you should think like a renter. If you're a renter, you should think like an owner. If you're an owner, you need to hold on to things loosely because it could all be taken away. Some of us have experienced this because we've lost our job and finances. Some people have had to sell their home. Um, you know, if there's, if there's any sure thing in this world is that everything is going to, everything's going to break down, every, everything is going to die, and you're going to lose it all in the end. You will. You're not going to, you're not going to be able to take any of it to heaven, and you're going to realize on your deathbed, none of it really mattered anyhow, except the peace, the, the people in your lives. So if you're an owner, you should think like a renter and hold on to things loosely because you're not really an owner because you don't own anything. Now, I know you've heard that in the church, but I'm telling you, you really do not own anything. I don't care whether you have, have you know, some sort of purchase agreement that you purchase something. God owns everything. You are a steward, which means you're stewarding, administering everything that God owns. God even owns you because your life can be taken from you. God owns you. God owns everything. And now if you're a renter, you should, you should kind of have a mindset of an owner. Take care of the stuff that's not yours. Take care of the stuff that's not yours because you are a steward. So if you're a Christian and you're a renter or you're an owner, hold on to it loosely and steward everything well that God has put in your administration or your stewardship. If you're renting, you need to take care of that place like it's your own. If you own it, you need to be willing to give it away to somebody who needs it. That's kingdom. 
you could that's an addition to what I wanted to teach, but that helped me. Because I thought like ownership is the end all, the end all. That's not that's not stewardship is the end all, the end all. God owns everything. And if and if you have that perspective, you, you don't get like uptight about stuff. It it like released me. It, I'm I'm like well, I shouldn't say this because you're gonna ask to borrow my tools. I don't like to lend out my tools. There are tools that I've lent out and I forgot who I lent them to and I never got them back. And I can't remember who I lent, lent them to. So, you know, so don't ask to borrow my tools. But, but I'm telling you, oh, they're not, I know, Lord, they're not my tools. They're the Lord's tools. I mean, just think about that. Think, of, think about how releasing that is. To me, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 50s. I'm just going to say that I'm in my 50s until I'm in my 60s. I'm, I'm in my 50s. We're, we sold our house. We're downsizing. I can't tell you how relieved I am to get rid of stuff. I've taken, I've taken at least a half, half a dozen like dump trailers of stuff and thrown it away. Now, I'm not like a hoarder, but I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a builder, so it's hard to throw wood away and that kind of stuff. But I, I'm telling you, I just, I, and I feel like it's freeing to get rid of stuff. And I, I, I hope you experience that someday. Anyhow, let's get into the parable. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. What I'm going to do is read through this. I'm going to interject a few things, and at the end I have five applications for us. Now, I know you may think that you know this, the parable of the talents well, but the reason why we re, re, we, re, re, we read, reread them Say that fast five times. We reread them. The reason we do that is because we haven't gotten it yet. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to learn something new from this, uh, from this parable. So follow along with me, starting with verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, those of you who have read this parable before know that the master in this, in this parable is God. And the servants are men, us, men and women, just like us. There are three categories of servants, two that look good and one that doesn't look so good. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it says the master went away on a long journey. And long journey means? Long journey. It means he went away for a long, for a long time. You know, so God, you know, he's, he, he's away. He expects his servants to manage his resources well. So... Uh, to one of the servants, he gave five talents. To another, two, and another one. Now, I, I, just something in me rises up when I, every time I read this, read this parable. Like, I don't think it's fair that the one servant got one, and the other servant got two, and the other, and, and that other servant got five. I mean, there's this like this un, un, this unfairness between the lines. But when you research a little bit, what a talent is. You, you start to not to care so much about fair, and you'd be willing to take the one talent from, from the third servant. Because in, in, today's, in today's day, a one, the one talent is worth about $1.4 million. One talent was about 20 years of salary. 20, so even if you got one, it was still pretty stinking good, right? So it was a million point, one, $1.4 million. So he gave, he gave five to one, he gave two to another, and he gave one to the third servant. And he gave to each according to his own ability. That's important. The master knew his servants, knew what they were good at, what they were not good at, and therefore made a judgment to give certain servants a certain amount of money or a certain amount of gold, whatever it was that he, he, he gave them, according to their own ability. You know, so in, in relation to God in us, God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our ability because he wired that ability in us. So he's giving us talents, he's giving us resources according to our own ability, our own ability to manage those resources well. So it's not unjust because it's God dishing out the resources and he knows what we can manage. So each one according to his own ability. Ability here is a Greek word, dunamis. What's dunamis? 
Yeah, power. It sounds like dynamite. You know, if, if you define, like, to his own ability, it, it's like ex- explosive power. Like, whatever your ability is that God has wired in you can be, like, like explosive, like an explosive power if it's used well and managed well. So it doesn't matter how small or big it is, it, it, it could be like dynamite in the hands of a kingdom son or daughter. So he gave these things out according to their own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went out and traded them and made another five talents. So he doubled the money. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. So that servant doubled his money. But he who had received one went, and what did he do? He dug a hole, and he put it in the ground. I'm just saying, if you were given $1.4 million, would you dig a hole and put it in the ground? Uh, Yeah, you're going to see that there was a better place at the end of the parable to put it. But that parable was so twisted in his thinking, so twisted in his thinking about who the master was, he's thinking, I'm just going to dig a hole and put it in there. I don't know what motivated him to do that. I don't know what was in his mind or in his thinking. We know that he was wicked. That's going to come out. We know that there was something wrong in this, in, in this servant's heart. He certainly had a wrong perspective of the master. But, you know, my mind wanders, and I'm thinking, why did he dig a hole and put it in the ground? Maybe he was hoping the master would die on the journey. It's not in the bank. There's no account for it. I'll get the $1.4 million and I won't have to give it back. I mean, that's the way my twisted mind goes. I don't know about yours. Oh, you're better than me, right? Yeah, it didn't even cross your mind, right? Yeah, right, sure. Then he who had received five talents went and traded them with, and doubled his money, two doubled the money, and then the one servant dug a hole in the ground and hid the Lord's money. Now, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You know, we as believers will be judged one day. In Revelations, this comes out. We, we will be judged for our words and our works. I don't know exactly what that means, but when I think about that, I think I need to be really careful with my words. What I say, what I think, what I post on social media, I need to be really careful about my words because accounting day... I'm going to have to account for those words that I've used. Works, if you are re- reward-driven, I'm having trouble with these re-words today. If you are re- reward-driven, then you know, the more you do for the Lord, you're going to get rewarded for it at the end. It says, you know, he's going to, he's going to look at the account and you know, who, who, who managed my resources well that I gave them, and I'm going to give them rewards. So one day we're going to be judged. If we were faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Listen listen to this. This is interesting. He who had also received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done and good and faithful servant. Heard that before, right? You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Does this sound a little similar to the reward of the other servant? I think we need to take note of that. I think it's intentionally communicated that way because he's trying to get a point across. It doesn't matter what your job is. It doesn't matter whether you think that you are not talented or not. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether, whether that person looks better than you or not. Your job is to, is to administrate and manage whatever God gave you, as little or as much as it is, well. And the reward is the same. We are so limited in our thinking. We are so temporal in our thinking. 
You know, we're here but for I don't know how many years. I mean, certainly, I mean, most people less than 100 years. And on the scale of eternity, it's a really small time. We spend a lot of time super concerned about a really small portion of eternity. Yet that 190, 80 years will, will determine where you're going to go, where you're going to spend eternity and, eternity and how you're going to be rewarded. And all the Lord is asking you to do is just manage what he's given you well and the reward is the same for somebody who you might deem more important than you. It's, it's the same reward for both, kind of, because something else comes out in the parable. But if, if the third servant wasn't wicked, it would be the same reward for all three of them. Then who received one talent came... Uh, where am I? 24? My 24 looks smaller than my 23 for some reason. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. So at least I didn't lose the $1.4 million. It's a little dirty because I buried it in the ground. But here, here, I'm returning it back to you. I wish he didn't come back. I wish he died on his journey. But here's the $1.4 million. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers at least. And at my coming, I would have received back at least interest. interest. What's savings account interest? It's so pathetic. <laughs> Point something, something, a significant number. So take the talent for him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Now, I want to bring something out. Just because the Lord said, you wicked, lazy servant, you knew that I did not reap where I have not sown, doesn't mean that the, that the master was admitting to be that way. If it's God, certainly that is not God. But for some reason, this wicked servant had such a terrible perspective of who the master was, such a wrong perspective and a wrong picture of who God was. He was, he was probably angry. Any of you ever been angry with God? After you've been angry with God and after you pouted and stomped and walked out of the room and came to your senses, you realized, wow, I was putting that on God and it's all me. That's, that's, that's most of the time. Now, some of you might still be angry with God and you're, I, 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 could, I could almost confidently say the anger is a bit misdirected because you think God should have stopped, stopped something that was actually in our control to stop. But this, this servant had a very twisted perspective of who God was. And because of his twisted perspective, the, the most he did was to bury the money. He didn't manage his resources well because of his view of God. I wonder how often our view of God, our perspective of God, gets in the way of our destiny here as sons and daughters of God. I wonder, I wonder how often it gets in the way of us being prosperous and really living out those things that God has called us to. I wonder how often. In my life, I wonder how often. I've, I've, I actually know for a fact that it has stunted my growth and my view of God. If you have a view of God that looks anything other than Jesus, it's a wrong view of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Jesus was loving, compassionate, forgiving, especially those who really needed it and were desperate. That's who Jesus is. Don't let, if you have a wrong view or a wrong perspective of God, and I think, I think people know when they have it. They don't know why they do, but they, but they push the blame on God. God. God is here to deliver you from that and reveal himself to you in a new way. I believe that this morning. So the Lord said in 26, you wicked and lazy, lazy servant, you knew that I would reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back at least interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. I love the way the message puts that, that, that portion of Scripture. He says, you, the master was furious. 
That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best, why didn't you do why why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little interest. Verse 29. For everyone who has more, it will be given, and will and will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, That could mean eternal damnation. There are some commentators that have a a different view. Um, The weeping and gnashing of teeth is an old Semitic Semitic term, and it means extreme disappointment. I, I suppose if you received eternal damnation, you'd be extremely disappointed. Either way, it's not... It's not a good place for the last servant. I want to conclude with, with five things, five, five ap- applications, and I can get through these really quickly. This thirst, the first thing I want to challenge us is with the reality of this, that, that God gives you your abilities. I mean, you could look around you, and I, I mean, I have kids that, that look so different that, than I am, and, I'm, and I ask God, it's like, how come it's so easy for them to do these things? You know, they were much more athletic than I was when I was younger. Um, I mean, much, much more musical, you know, but somehow, somehow my wife and I, who's perfect and so talented, ma- she married somebody as imperfect as me, and, and we have these wonderful, beautiful, talented kids. But, but the, the more I observe them, I realize they didn't even try they didn't even try. It's like they don't deserve the, the, the talent that they got. God just gave it to them. I mean, I have kids that are musical. God just wired that in them. God wired you, hardwired you with something, some sort of ability. He wants you to use it faithfully, and the reward will be the same for you as for a, the president of the United States if he was a godly president of the United uh, States. I mean, the, the reward is the same for all if you just steward your abilities wisely that God has given you. They all come from the Lord. So don't gloat if you're much more talented than I am. The second thing, make sure your view of God is a healthy view of God. God is not an angry taskmaster. He is not up there waiting for you to mess up. He's not waiting for you, or, you know, like he's not disgusted with you thinking, man, I, I just gave them all that stuff. I gave them all that, all that potential and they're wasting it. He's not hanging up with the Holy Spirit complaining. Can you believe that, Holy Spirit? What a waste of time. That, that person, that, you know, the, the, just such a Dave, Dave, Pastor Dave is such a waste of time. It takes him so long to get it. I, he can read the same verse five times and he can't remember it. I mean, that's not God. He's not a taskmaster. Taskmaster. He's like Jesus. He's super patient and he's super loving. And if you have a bad view of God, I pray, I pray that the Holy Spirit gives you a different picture and a different image. It might mean you have to repent of something, just so you know. The third thing, get to know the God who made you. Be comfortable in your own skin. It's taken me about 50 years to be comfortable in my own skin. I mean, I used to look around and want to be everybody else but me. And, you know, I'm pretty comfortable being in my skin. I, you know, I'm not perfect. I, I admit that. But, but if I exude any sort of confidence, it's only because I just feel comfortable in my skin. It, it's like, you know, God put this in me. I don't have to be the best preacher. I don't have to be that. I don't have to be the best pastor. I just have to be yours. And by the way, you didn't get a perfect one. It's just the way it goes. I don't think you came here to find a perfect pastor. I don't think you came here because this is a perfect church. Because if you did, don't come here because you'll ruin it. Fourth thing. We need to put faith into practice. That was talked about a little this morning. Um, Faith is the evidence of things, no, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, but it doesn't mean there's no evidence. The evidence is you and how you respond to faith. And when you respond in faith, evidence reveals itself. Often in healing, I mean, transformational things, visions, dreams, should have an outward manifestation and effect on you and everything around you. 
And the last thing is this. Don't be afraid to take risk. You know, the things, the, the, the most beautiful and exciting things that have happened in my life is because I was willing to just say, Lord, I cannot do this. I don't feel like I have the ability. I'm so imperfect. I'm so flawed. But you told me to go this way, and I'm going to do it. And it's amazing what can happen. It's amazing. It's amazing when you begin to step out in faith. Some of you have to overcome fear. I think really fear is the root of all of it. But you have to overcome fear. You have to overcome insecurity. You have to overcome your pain of the past. You, you, your, your fear of entering into new relationships because, because the last five didn't work out. You have to overcome. I mean, be directed by the Holy Spirit by all means. But, but you've you got to take risk. You've got to love again. You've got to take the risk of loving again. You've got to take the risk of, you know, blowing it again. It's no big deal. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. Whatever it is, you're going to get rid of it by stepping out in faith, by taking risk. And if you do it God's way, then it's going to have good results. It's going to produce good results. Maybe not, maybe not the results that you expect, but God has good things in store for you. But you've got to respond to them, and you've got to start being a kingdom steward. Amen? Amen. God bless you, and I'm going to let... Where'd Michael go? Michael. Michael, you're going to make me close? That's so weird. Maybe you got raptured and you all got left behind. <laughs> if you have that theology. <laughs> he is wearing white. <laughs> this, this is all planned. <laughs> oh, well, wait a minute. I got left behind then too. With... One thing that's important I take away from this whole thing is that how intentional God is. He is intentional on how he made you and what he has placed inside of you. He has given us all some magnificent gifts. And no one gives gifts that they don't, that they don't intend on you reopening and actually applying. Your uniqueness is needed. You are needed in this season the way you are. Own it. So, Lord, we just th I just thank you for every last person who is in this room, Lord. The giftings that you have given us the leadership in this uh, church as well, and everyone watching online, I just speak blessings over our lives. Cover us, Lord God. Guide us in your way. Show us the ways that we ought to live. Bring out everything that you have placed inside of us, Lord God, so that we may bring it back to you and honor you. I speak a hedge of protection around every last person in this room and watching online. May we make it home safely. I loose your angels in the midst of us. And we give you our week, Lord. Thank you for the gift and the knowledge and the word that's been brought forth by this man of God, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. And before we head out, I just want to um, thank all the visitors who came. I want to invite you to um, please get connected with us online. We would love to stay connected with you come again. We want to continue to grow with you, fellowship with you. I also want to mention that tonight is corporate prayer. It is back. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. in the old sanctuary. Join us. Also, um, we have altar ministry meeting right now. Uh, right after service <laughs> um, over to my left and your right anyone that's seeking salvation who want to give their life to the Lord anyone who's seeking healing or breakthrough we have these banners set up please go over <laughs> we're in a social distance please wear your mask over there <laughs> I think that's all I got so um, <laughs> be blessed in your week please join us next week Lord Again, we just cover every last person in this room, bless them as they depart, and as they move forth in this week, we give you honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.